My name is Chanel Johnson. I'm the first full-time Black and Minorities Ethnic Student Officer. I'm proud to present our Black History Lecture Series. Andrew Mohammed presents Get Up, Stand Up. Bob Marley's father and his mother gave birth to Bob on February the 6th, 1945. He was actually born at his mother's father's house and his father was, and her mother, and his mother's father was a respected doctor, herbal herbalist. And so they were born, and um, in fact, the mother of Bob Marley, Sedilla Malcolm, she actually named Bob Nesta Bob Marley. But when they uh, was registering him, the registrar thought that, no, the word Nesta, or the name Nesta, is feminine. And he actually decided on his own back to change the first name to the middle name and the middle name back to the first name. So he became known as Robert Nesta Marley. But look at the word Nesta. The word Nesta literally means the messenger, wise messenger. And I personally believe that that's what Bob became. In 1955, his father, Norval Marley, died. Bob was only 10 years old. And due to financial constraints and that literally the mother was receiving no money in the countryside of St. Anne's, they decided to move down into Kingston and they lived in an area known as Trench Town. Now for those of you who may not know much about Jamaica, Trench Town is one of the most renowned ghettos of Jamaica. Trench Town, you've got to be tough, you've got to be streetwise, you've got to be have a lot of credit to literally live and survive in Trench Town. One of the reasons why they called it Trench Town, which had a bad name from day one, was because it was built on trenches, sewers, sewer trenches. So the smell and the stench and the aroma of the area literally was, wasn't very good at all. Also, when you study during slavery, that was the area and the point where slaves were brought to and sold. And so Trench Town never really had a good name from day one. But that was where Bob had to grow up. And in doing that, he had to become very strong. Bob was of mixed race, obviously, and he was very small for his stature. And he was picked on a hell of a lot, but Bob never gave up. He took up boxing, he took up self-defense, and he became a very strong brother in that neighborhood. Okay? And he earned the name the Tough Gong because of his strength, because of his battle. He never allowed to be pushed around. At that time, Bob Miley's mother met Thaddeus. Livingston, which was the father of Bunny Livingston, um, and they both had a baby together, and that's where Bob met Bunny Whaler, who was also part of the Whalers. And so they were very strong um, friends. They were linked literally by blood. They both had the same sister, and they moved together and they sang together. At that time, obviously, times were very hard in Kingston, and so. By Bob moving down into Kingston, he was now able to listen to the impulse coming from America. And some of the greatest influences of Bob Marley, that early young Bob Marley, 10, 11 years old, were great people like Fats Domino, Ray Charles, Curtis uh, Mayfield, and the Impressions, and so on. Okay, they influenced, Bob was listening to the R&B coming out of America, and it hit him. He then met with a fantastic mentor of his, known as Joe Higgs. Joe Higgs himself was a famous musician already, and he mentored Bob, and he mentored Bunny. And then he met a third person and introduced them to Bunny and um, Bob, and that person was the great Peter Tosh. And from those three meeting up, was born one of the greatest revolutionary bands known in the 20th century, known as the Wailers. They were so poor when they initially started off. And it was Bob that was so determined to excel in this art of music that he literally, it was said, forced the others to literally sometimes rehearse for over 18 hours a day. They would literally make guitar strings from electrical wires, discard electrical wires, and that's how they made their instruments. And they were literally turning over something like three pounds a week based on their music. But Bob never gave up. He met a musician one day that literally was making music 
in terms of records in the studio, and he introduced Bob to Leslie Gong. And Bob made his first record called Judge Me Not. And if you listen to that music, if you listen to that first track, that young Bob, as a young teenager, was given a message to black people in Jamaica, stop judging each other. Yeah? So he became that little wise messenger. He became the, the nester that his mother prophesied that he would be, that wise messenger. And he excelled. That record became number one. And in those days, the studios kept all the money. So even though he's hitting, having hits as a very young boy, and the Wailers were having hits, they were literally penniless. They still had to work full time. And then they met a fantastic man called Clements Dodd, who became known as Sir Coxon. And Sir Coxon was a, a great studio performer. And he had his own studio sound called Studio One. The Wailers were attached to that Studio One. And they played. And they made a, a track called Simmer Down. Again, became number one. And why did they call it Simmer Down? Was because at that time, the youth in Jamaica were, were involved in riots and upsurges. People were poor. People were angry. People were tired. But guess what? They gave a message to simmer down, to cool down, to come together. So what I'm trying to say is that Bob from day one became a messenger to his people. Okay? And he tried to cool the people down. In 1966, Bob's mother decided to emigrate to America and Bob decided to go with her. At that time, he had met his childhood sweetheart and they left together. And they stayed in America and Bob was working literally as a forklift driver, cleaning out toilets. He was doing all kind of odd man jobs because he just said, I need a chance to make it. But when he left to go to America, a famous icon traveled to Jamaica and he's one of the greatest influences on Bob's life and I'm talking about Rastafari, Haley Selassie. Haley Selassie decided to um, go to Jamaica and that one visit became history in Jamaica and Bob Marley saw the effect that it had amongst the community and he started to find out more about what Haley Selassie and the Rastafarians were teaching and he said that that literally answered a lot of the questions that he had in his own head about why we as a people can't get along. The second main influence on Bob Marley was the man that I call the Honourable Marcus Messiah Garvey. Love that man with all my heart. Marcus Garvey gave birth to one of Bob's greatest records called Redemption Song. And Bob Marley spoke about us as a people. Bob Marley, um, the Honourable Marcus Messiah Garvey became the national hero of Jamaica. He was in America and he created one of the largest movements um, in the Western diaspora of African people called the UNIA, United Negro Improvement Association. And he got black people together, over five to six million without the aid of Facebook and Twitter. And he got us organized and working. And that was a massive inspiration to Bob Marley when he read about him. Also, uh, Marcus Garvey would say, a people without no knowledge of their history is like a tree with no roots. They both die. And Bob Marley, that young Bob Marley realized that we as a people have not been taught our history. And so therefore he was now, he had an insatiable thirst to know more about who he was. The Honorable Marcus Messiah, God, the Honorable Marcus Messiah, Messiah Garvey said this, if you have no confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. So again, Bob Marley realized that I've got to have confidence in myself and surround myself with success. And this is what Bob Marley's line went on. He came back to Jamaica, okay? And he decided to become a Rasta, not just in name, but in his heart and in his blood. And he decided to literally use that and the Wailers started to use that in their music. Why were they called the Wailers? Because they would sing about the, the pain and the feelings of the, what they were going through in Jamaica, what their people were going through. And Bob Marley and the Wailers began to change history. They were then blessed to meet a great, 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 great producer called Lee Scratch Perry. And Bob Marley and the Wailers joined his studio. 
They had a new band called the Upsetters, and this became some of the greatest works, what we call today the Bob Marley and the Wailers. Together, the first album they produced with Lee Scratch Perry was called Soul Rebels, and it had a message that they were rebels of the soul. They were not allowed, they were not literally willing to literally live under poverty. They wanted to change and become rebels and give a message of hope and liberation to all the oppressed people. They then set up their own record label, label called Tough Gong, which was the nickname of Bob Marley when he was much younger. And they had great success under that too. But this is what led the Marley and the, sorry, Bob Marley and the Whalers to their new destiny. They met a man called Johnny Nash. They agreed to write some scores of music for CBS. But CBS, halfway through the agreement, abandoned them, left them penniless. And Bob Marley decided to think outside the box. They were now stranded in London, no money, nothing. So what did Bob do? Again, like great people, they always think outside the box. He decided to go into the owner of Ireland Records, Chris Blackwell. And he said, I am Bob Marley. I'm from the Wailers. And guess what? We're the greatest thing that's ever been born in terms of the world of musical reggae. And if you give us £4,000, we'll go back to Jamaica and create an album that's going to live in history. And believe it or not, at that time, Bob went into his office at the right time because Chris Blackwell was also the, the manager of one of our greatest singers called Jimmy Cliff. And Jimmy Cliff, at that time, had left Island Records, so there was a gaping hole that had to be filled by someone. And when Bob came in, he looked like that rebel that Chris Blackwell was looking for, someone who could literally be like that rock star for reggae music. And that's where Bob Marley came in. They went back to Jamaica, and you know what? They honored their agreement. They had that 4,000 pounds, they didn't buy any flashing cars of it or anything like that. They plumbed it right back into their music. And they created one of the greatest albums known in reggae music, Catch a Fire. And Bob Marley at that moment gave birth to a new form of music. And they were now ready to tour the world. And brothers and sisters, the story of Bob Marley carries on. But I would like to end there, I want you just to think about overcoming obstacles and what this great man gave us. One love, one community, and one destiny. My name is Brother Andrew Mohammed. They call me the investigator. Thank you very much.